This video is brought to you by Paragon, my own original sci-fi novel coming February 25th. I vaguely remember when Andromeda was first on TV. And as a child I was already swimming in oceans of great sci-fi television, and my brain craved more, so I was completely hooked into Andromeda's first few episodes. Years later in my 20s I spied a few episodes on DVD and took them out for a whirl, and within the first 10 minutes or so I realised how badly my memories had disappointed me. Kicking off in the year 2000, Andromeda follows the titular ship and its captain who comes out of a 300 year stasis to discover the system's commonwealth, an intergalactic alliance of worlds and races, has fallen. So Captain Hunt teams up with a new band to return the universe to prosperity. Now I want to know a bunch of positive things right up front. This is a fantastic premise for a sci-fi show. It's basically, what if Isaac Asimov's foundation, but it had a protagonist. And on paper the universe in Andromeda has all the flourishes of classic pulpy Flash Gordon-esque adventure, but with the scale and world building potential of 50s era sci-fi literature classics. My other major positive is the Andromeda itself, I absolutely adore this ship design. It is gorgeous in its slick silvery appearance, but alien in its shapes and silhouette. It's a perfect visual representation of the idea of the system's commonwealth itself. You tell me this is the flagship of essentially the United Federation of Planets, but across three galaxies and a thousand years in the future? This is the perfect ship for that idea. Which makes it a real shame when the rest of the show's presentation seems so lazy. The universe of Andromeda is fantastic on paper. There are a bunch of really interesting creative ideas within this show, but the way those ideas are presented and the production's efforts to render them on screen leave much to be desired. When it comes to costuming, set design and makeup effects, Andromeda just doesn't hold a candle to its contemporary Star Trek, Stargate, Babylon 5 or Farscape. VFX are largely subpar even for the time, sound effects are stock and there's just a general blandness to the filmmaking of most episodes. It's not strictly bad, but with a bit more effort it could have felt like an alternative to those other shows, but the translation from script to screen is overall quite poor. Take these shots for example. Both are supposed to be the crew and ship belonging to super advanced prosperous factions which represent the best of the best, and on the Star Trek side of things that idea is totally sold. The uniforms are colourful but they're smart and well fitted. They look like officers even if they're not strictly military officers. The colour scheme around the characters looks bright and orderly with advanced looking displays and stations. The whole mood of this room and the people within it communicate maximum advancement but also maximum comfort. And when compared to the exterior of the ship, the designs match perfectly. But with Andromeda there's a strange disconnect between what's on paper as well as a disconnect between the interior and exterior designs. Andromeda's interior is predominantly warm coloured and the structures generally have an emphasis on rigid angles, heavy bulkheads, none of which is reflected in the smooth silvery exterior of the ship. The uniforms as well are a strange choice. The red leather jackets, boots and cargo trousers make these guys out to be more likely pilots or ground troops of some kind. This may seem nitpicky by dwelling on this, but it's just one example of how Andromeda's overall depiction of its universe is sloppier than what's come to be expected from shows of this kind. Other examples are the Magog having a society and life cycle structured like insects, even though they appear like these hairy primate boar things, or the Nietzscheans being a society structured on eugenics, making them physically and intellectually superior to most others, and yet they roam around as tribes and have a barbarian raider aesthetic. Character-wise it's a mixed bag. Lisa Ryder as Becca Valentine is pretty good. The classic archetype of a rust bucket captain with a heart of gold is well portrayed and Ryder definitely has the charisma to make it work. Unfortunately like most characters in the show, she was never really given her due because of reasons I'll get into later. Laura Bertram as Transgemini is one of the few members of the ensemble who improves later down the line. Her cutesy uselessness soon leads to some brilliant implications of far-reaching intelligence. I get the feeling Harper was assumed to be the de facto fan favourite, but this guy is borderline insufferable most of the time. It's like Chris O'Dowd in the Cloverfield Paradox, someone told Gordon Wovelet to be the funny one, and the performance feels so self-conscious and try-hard. I never feel like Harper has a genuine personality, but instead I see a blatant attempt to prod some giggles from the audience. It's just cynical writing. Once in a while he drops the facade and actually comes across as relatable, but those moments are too few and far between to make this character enjoyable. Tier Anasazi was pretty good. As a discount approximation of Ronin and Teal, you could do far worse. Lexa Doiga's Romy was pretty great honestly. I'm a sucker for vaguely artificial beings discovering their humanity, and Doig has the wide-eyed optimism to make the arc compelling, even if it has been done before. Andromeda's emphasis on AI is one of the rare times it manages to distinguish itself successfully from similar shows in both concept and execution. But we have to get to the jarhead in the room, Captain Dylan Hunt 
played by Kevin Sorbo. Kevin Sorbo sucks. Kevin Sorbo has always sucked. He sucked on Hercules, he sucks on this show, and he definitely sucks now. Being tall and in shape does not constitute a personality. Not only does Sorbo have a severely limited acting range, but he's the textbook example of a complete charisma vacuum. The character of Hunt is also a complete block of wood. Any avenues for him to possibly be interesting aren't capitalised on, and even if they were, Sorbo wouldn't have the acting skills needed to make them work anyway. But the major reason the arcs of these characters never really hit their targets is because, well, the storyline of the show misses the mark. The first two seasons are a mixed bag with inconsistent execution, but I'd be lying if I said there wasn't some enjoyment to be found here. As I said, the premise itself is great, and there are enough flashes of clever concepts and plenty of pew pew action to hold viewers' attention week to week. The overall story is also strong. At first, Becca and her crew are on board Andromeda really because there's nowhere better, and Hunt still has to largely convince them that rebuilding the Commonwealth is at all possible and worthwhile. The season finale is where things jump up a gear. Although once again the awesome concept and design behind the Magog worldship only leads to folk running around a reused Star Trek set, the drama and threat of the worldship and the Abyss Big Bad are well established. From here the arcs of our characters and the progression of the main story are clear. At first rebuilding the Commonwealth was simply a nice idea, but now it's a necessity. And just as the crew come together to get behind the idea, so too does the rest of the universe. But unfortunately that solid plan for a well-structured story was neutered by the departure of the original showrunner. The episode Ouroboros was his final episode as lead writer, and it's a really good one. The swapping of purple trance for future trance is unexpected and welcome, but by the end of season 2, they accomplish their mission. A new commonwealth is created, and the central premise of the entire show is basically gone. The ticking clock of the impending Magog worldship invasion, and the motivation to fight it, is pretty much forgotten in the next season. Now the Andromeda crew just sort of blunder around space for episodic adventures. The decision to complete this arc at the end of season 2 effectively crippled any chances of Andromeda improving in quality. By jumping the gun with the main story, it also jumps the gun in the arcs of our main characters. It would be like in Game of Thrones if the Seven Kingdoms united to fight the White Walkers in Season 4, or if Voyager got home in Season 5. Babylon 5 showed us blatantly what happens when a show runs out of story, but while that show had the talents and planning of J. Michael Straczynski as a showrunner, Andromeda effectively had no showrunner, just a new team of writers which was tasked with turning a collection of scraps into new material. There's a great rule of fiction which is to ask a writer two questions. One, is this the most interesting thing which happened? And if the answer is no, the second question is, why aren't you showing us that then? It's the same reason things like the Hobbit movies don't work. You can't swap out the War of the Ring with a game of Keep Away with the Arkenstone, and you can't swap the promise of a fate of the universe battle against the literal personification of despair with bullshit about a Nietzschean messiah and Dylan Hunt maybe having magical powers. When the Magog worldship does reappear, there's no proper build-up, and the resulting clash leads into Andromeda's true low as a series. Stranding the cast on a boring planet to do a boring riff on a space western. Even though seasons 3 and 4 had lost momentum, at least we still had the potential for some interesting aliens to show up or some cool sci-fi concept to explore. But here we get dull plodding around a generic scrapyard town, and every now and then some dude shows up to imply something greater is going on without ever committing to it. The eventual finale is a contrived mess of powers and timey-wimey nonsense, and by the time it's all over, the eyes of the audience have glazed over, and rather than being thrilled, it's just exhausting. So Andromeda, did it suck? Well, with two good not great seasons, two mediocre at best seasons, and one truly awful one, yeah, it pretty much did. And it's a real shame. If there was any sci-fi show which needed a reboot, it's this. Because with audiences now more accustomed to long-running serialised stories and the more advanced production techniques, the brilliant creative concepts which Andromeda often failed to bring to life could really be done justice. But as it stands, Andromeda is an early 2000s relic which unfortunately had its potential squandered. Christopher Smith asks, when did you first get into watching Star Trek? I have been watching Star Trek for pretty much my entire life. I don't remember what my first episode or movie was. Some of my earliest memories as a child are of me and my family parked in front of the TV watching Star Trek. Uh, both my parents are into Trek and they had VHS tapes of a few movies and there were always reruns on TV. Uh, we had the fact files, we had magazines, books, toys, and built things out of Lego. We've just been obsessed with Star Trek forever. As a kid, I always watched uh, the original series, Next Gen, and the movies at the time. However, while I was vaguely aware of DS9, Voyager, and Enterprise, I didn't properly watch them until my teens. In truth, I don't know when I first started watching Star Trek, because it's just been ever-present in my life. 
If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. You can see my videos early on my Patreon for as little as $5 a month. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank my patrons Chris Lord, Andy Luke, Larry Bennett, James, James Vanderhaeg, T. Stoney, L. Carton, and Millie Coleman. Until next time, have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.